The NBA season is beginning just after a maximally dramatic end to the WNBA season. Meanwhile, the WNBA players just opted out of their CBA. We also have stories from the NFL, NBA, and MLS. It's Tuesday, October 22nd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're getting prepped for the NBA season with longtime team executive Scott Perry. We're looking back at an incredible WNBA season with our reporter, Margaret Fleming. And our tuned-in columnist, Mike McCarthy, talks about how the Brady rules are going to make it hard for Fox's lead analyst to do his job. Plus, an MLS owner said something that sports team owners never say publicly, and Browns fans are in the spotlight for cheering Deshaun Watson's injury. First, here are your top headlines. Friday is a huge night for the LA New York rivalry, and Fox is hosting it all. Following Game 1 of the World Series between the Dodgers and the Yankees, Big Ten After Dark will air featuring a game between Rutgers and USC. It's a huge stroke of luck for Fox, who is hosting one of the most highly anticipated World Series matchups directly before a college football game that features teams from the same markets. The inaugural season of TGL, Tiger Woods and Roy McIlroy's tech-infused stadium-based golf league, is officially teeing off on January 7th, 2025. The first match will see Ricky Fowler and Xander Schauffele's New York Golf Club face off against the Bay Golf Club, which includes Ludwig Aberg and Wyndham Clark. TGL is set to have 15 regular season matches, which will air on ESPN, with playoffs starting March 17th. The league is meant to complement the PGA Tour's long daytime tournaments with its two-hour primetime matches. Over to soccer, a group of over 100 professional women's soccer players sends an open letter to FIFA asking for the end of its partnership with oil and gas conglomerate Saudi Aramco. The letter said, We urge FIFA to reconsider this partnership and replace Saudi Aramco with alternative sponsors whose values align with gender equality, human rights, and the safe future of our planet. The letter also asked for FIFA to set up a review committee with the player representation that will evaluate the ethical implications of future sponsorship deals. FIFA signed a four-year deal with Aramco in April that will see them become a major partner for the soccer body, including for the 2026 World Cup and 2027 Women's World Cup. Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser proposed a bill to buy Capital One Arena for Monumental Sports and Entertainment to keep the Wizards and Caps playing in D.C. Under the proposed bill, D.C. would buy the arena for $87.5 million and renovations would be completed by the start of the 2027-28 seasons for both the Wizards and Caps. Monumental CEO Ted Leonsis originally sought to move the teams to Alexandria, Virginia, but those plans fell through after legal obstacles within the Virginia Senate. If the new bill passes, DC would lease Capital One Arena to Monumental through at least 2050. Disney announced that they will be naming Bob Iger successor to CEO in early 2026. Iger, who returned to Disney in 2022 after stepping down just two years prior, is on a contract that runs through December 2026. In regards to the timing of the announcement, new chairman James Gorman said, This timing allows ample time for a successful transition before the conclusion of Bob Iger's contract in December 2026. The NBA season is here, and it has all the ingredients to be a really fun one. Between the parody in the league right now and the narratives within certain individual teams, there's a ton to discuss. I spoke with former NBA executive Scott Perry on what to expect this season, and that's coming up next. I'm joined now by longtime NBA exec, most recently GM of the Knicks, Scott Perry. Welcome, Scott. Thanks so much, Owen. Excited to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you on. Um, so <clears throat> the NBA season is upon us. We're starting with Celtics versus Knicks. Plenty of good teams in the East, but do you see those two as the, the two to beat? I really do, Owen, and here's why. First of all, the Boston Celtics defending champions, uh, they are a complete basketball team, as they showed us last year. Everyone is coming back. I know Kristaps Porzingis won't be available until January, but uh, you've got Jason Tatum, you've got um, Jalen Brown, um, uh, Drew Holiday, Derek White. Those guys have been the model of consistency. They have a championship under their belt. And the unique thing about this team this year is that although they got that monkey off their back, if you will, in terms of winning the championship last year, this group still has a lot to prove. You move fast forward to the summer, Jason Tatum kind of had a turbulent uh, <laughs> Olympic run, if you will, but not playing a couple of games. That became a big narrative for him. So, you know, he's feeling a certain way about that. Jalen Brown is feeling a certain way for not being included on that Olympic team. 
So now you've got your, your top two players that are going to be highly motivated to prove a lot of people wrong, uh, you know, on their way uh, to repeating. Uh, the coach, Joe Mazzula, who did a terrific job last year, I think will be more settled in as a head coach. Um, and so I really expect big things out of this Celtics team, and I think they have a good chance to repeat. The Knicks, as you mentioned, uh, I, I have them uh, right behind the Celtics, highly competitive group. Jalen Brunson had a phenomenal career year last year, put himself uh, as an all-NBA player into the MVP conversation. Uh, you go out this summer, you add Mikael Bridges, who brings versatility defensively, which Coach Tom Thibodeau is going to like. You re-sign OG Ananobi, make the big trade for Carl Anthony Towns, who's going to enhance the ability to, to space the floor from that four and five position because of his ability to shoot threes. And, and, uh, and while they may have taken a little bit of hit in terms of the depth and losing Dante DiVincenzo and some of the toughness that uh, Julius Randle brought to the table, still going to be a highly competitive, uh, highly skilled bunch. And I think they're going to feel like they have a lot to prove open, going against the champ, defending champs opening night ring ceremony, which historically is a really a tough game for the home team, for the championship team, because of all of the distractions and getting the rings before the game. So it'll be uh, really exciting to see how that plays out opening night. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. And yeah, with the Olympics, it suddenly felt like the narrative is that like Jason Tatum's not that good, which, you know, <laughs> right. you know we got to understand we're grading, grading on a curve with that team. But exactly. um, what do you think it means for the NBA to have these two markets like as active and competitive as they are? I think it's tremendous for business. Look, there's no secret. New York is the largest media market in this country and one of the largest in the entire world. Uh, so when the Knicks are good, historically, that has been great for business uh, within the NBA. The Boston Celtics, 18-time champions, one of the uh, most iconic, if not the most iconic franchise in the entire NBA. Uh, when they're good as well, you got a huge following. So that Northeast, as we know, is makes up a huge part of the view, viewing population uh, in in all the sports, but in particular NBA basketball. So I think it's uh, great for the league. Uh, so you you have your top markets that have excellent teams who will be in contention while you have parity throughout this entire league. And the Celtics, of course, have probably as good a chance as any recent champion to go back to back. Uh, but it's been since the Warriors in was like 1819 and something, one of those the, in the the last two years of the Warriors, right. you know, four straight mm -hmm. champion finals appearances um, since we've had back to back champions. Uh, but before that, it felt like dynasties were pretty normal in the NBA, if not winning mm -hmm. every year, at least being in probably the finals. Right. Do you think um, like, you know, this is the new normal of, you know, parity and no one really staying at the top for all that long? I really do. I mean, look, the talent continues to increase in this league and it's being dispersed across the league abroad. Uh, your ability to put together teams now has changed a lot. So in terms of being able to just have loaded, just one or two loaded teams, it's it's harder to do that now in terms of when you're trying to manage the salary cap. A lot of this, you know, we've talked about, uh, over the uh, here recent times with this first and second apron and and the tax ramifications the teams have. So it makes it a little more difficult for the teams that are willing to spend a lot of money to stay good all the time because they're going to be restricted in terms of how they improve their team. So I think it's great for the league that you have this type of parity because when you start this year, I mean, yeah, you can have a team like Boston that may be the favorite, but I, as I look at the Eastern Conference, just four or five teams to me that legitimately have a chance to come out of the Eastern Conference as their representative. And then you go over to the Western Conference and it's, you might have 10 or 11 teams that could have a say in that because it's that deep. So uh, I think it's excellent for the league right now. Yeah, and I think that's something Adam Silver has, has really tried to, you know, that's a big part of his legacy is trying to create this parody where, yeah, it, it's just hard to have a dynasty. We don't have like, you know, Michael Jordan just winning every time. We don't have LeBron in the finals every year. 
right. um you know maybe Wemby will be that next guy where he's just yes. unstoppable and he's always yeah. going to be there but um but yeah for now yeah like you said there are so many finals matchups that are at least plausible right now yeah, well, th- no question and you bring up Wemby because Wemby is the is that next generational talent that we see on the scene. So it will be interesting to watch his journey and if he could be that guy that brings that back uh, in terms of, okay, San Antonio is going to be a dynasty and you're going to have to go through Wimby every year if you want to win the championship. So that that's uh, – but they have a lot of growing to do. He has a lot of growing to do, and they have a lot of additions that they've got to make to their ball club before they can really put themselves in that conversation that they're going to be there every year. Yeah, it just feels like, you know, maybe it's with Chris Paul or or who knows, but like there's sometimes there's like a lob play to him where it's just like he, he can just elevate higher than anyone else. Exactly. And so and then just basically put the ball in the basket like with very little effort. So um there they might just get to the point where like every game he's gonna score like forty points on just plays like that. Uh, we'll see, though. You know, we yeah. say this now, and things things might be totally different in like a year. Like maybe right. people will just figure it out. Right. Yeah. Well, the defensive trophy. Start watching out. You might want to start putting his name on that defensive trophy starting this year, because <laughs> he was definitely scratching the surface of being all defensive team and the defensive player of the year, I should say, uh, last season. If there is a team, you know, and we don't have to like you know, name that team exactly. But like, mm-hmm. I'm just wondering in terms of structurally, if a team can put together a five, six year run of just always at least being in the conference finals, you know, sometimes the finals, sometimes winning the championship, um, but something more sustainable than, um, than this like whole like second apron system makes easy. What, what would that look like? Is there a formula out there that for sustainable success in this NBA? Well, one of the things I used to, when I was a front office executive and then especially during my time as a general manager and, and um, you know, over the last you know, decade, um, one of the most important things you can do is understand how to place proper valuation on talent. What do I mean by that? Okay, the star players, are, you know, the LeBron Jameses of the world, the Steph Currys and all those guys, okay, we know they're going to get – max dollars they're going to command that because they're going to make your team viable each and every season they're going to be a big draw both home and on the road you know and so those are you know in my opinion like true you know max players and i I know i'm leaving out of some others but i use those two guys as an example but the key is is finding a core group of players who i would classify as middle tier in terms of what they're going to cost you in terms of salary that can maybe if you can find one or two players that are at that mid-level range that can outperform their contract and play like a guy that's 20 25 minute million or you know close to you know an all-star performer the more guys like that you can get on your roster to me it allows you a chance to have a sustainable run. You need those kind of players. And then I, and it allows you to build depth on your team. I'm a firm believer in depth. Look, it's 82 game season, there are injuries that occur. We talk about it all the time. And so you talk about a team winning the championship, they got to be able to stay healthy, but there are injuries along the way. What you, when you have good depth, so you say you're missing one, one or two of your top players throughout the course of the season for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Do you have backups that can come in and help keep the ship afloat and not fall off a cliff? So, for example, if it's a 10-game game stretch and you're without you, you know, one or two, two of your top players, in that 10-game stretch, can you stay five and five, six and four versus going – two and eight, one and nine, or 0 and 10. That, to me, that's how you build a a team that has a chance to be good long-term and also, uh, you know, gives you a chance to to, to really compete for a championship. So that's how I I look at it. Yeah, no, I feel like it's underrated in pretty much every sport. Um, And, you know, when you get to the playoffs, sometimes you're a little banged up or just, like, the other team, like, centers their whole defense on like stopping your two best guys. And so you, you need other weapons. Um, Let's hop over to the West. And we've mostly been talking, talking East, but um, the other matchup is 
Lakers Wolves, the other matchup to start the season. Uh, that's you know an, an up and coming Wolves team that could be very exciting. The Lakers, <coughs> excuse me, the Lakers. The I feel like I mean, I'm just watching them with with some nerves because they hired LeBron's podcast host to be their coach. <laughs> they drafted his son. I could see either of those moves. You know, if not like fully blowing up, like maybe Redick just like struggles as a first year coach. Maybe Bronny is like not ready to be an NBA player. And I wonder how awkward things can get there. Not an easy situation. Look, I, I worked with JJ Redick uh, when I was an executive at Orlando Magic. So I know JJ is a, a very hard worker. He obviously is very knowledgeable about the game. But now he's going to be learning on the fly at one of the most scrutinized organizations in all of sports, that being the Los Angeles Lakers. So, um, you know, how quickly he can adjust and find his rhythm and his comfort level as a head coach in making some of the tough decisions that are required as a head coach, that will obviously play a key role into what they're able to do this year. You know, health is always going to be a big thing. Look, LeBron James has – uh, still continues to keep Father Time at bay and, and still is winning that race with Father Time. But he's still going to be 40 years old this season. Uh, so you worry about, you know, obviously he can't sustain the same level of energy that he did when he was 30. Uh, but he's still, an, you know, an excellent player. Anthony Davis, they got a tremendous year out of him last year, and he played a lot more in the regular season than he had in, in recent seasons. Can he coming off an Olympic year and playing, he play, I think he played like 74, 75 games last year in the regular season. Can he maintain that level of health? Those two factors are going to be huge for this team to even have a chance. You know, they were, they were knocked out in the first round of the uh, playoffs last year after going to the conference finals the year before. So there's going to be a lot of scrutiny, a lot of pressure. And Los Angeles is one of those markets, just like New York when I was there. When teams come to play in Los Angeles, you are going to get their best effort every night. So that's that's tough to do. And then you factor on the whole Bronny James story. Now, I, what I do think they will manage that uh, effectively after the early part of the season. Bronny gets a chance to play in a regular season game with his dad a couple of times my opinion from what I can see from afar, I can see him playing a lot with the G League because he needs minutes and time that he probably won't be able to get with the big team on the Lakers right now. So that will take care of itself uh, after the early part of the season and won't be as big a distraction or story as it's been to this point. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to watch. And then you talk about the Minnesota Timberwolves. I love this team. I love the, you know, with the deal. Yeah, they, they moved on from an excellent player in Carl Anthony Towns, but they got a player that I know very well uh, in Julius Randle, who's a three-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA uh, performer, tough, physical. Uh, I think you're going to get a chance to really see him fit in really well next to Anthony Edwards. That'll be a great fit. And then Dante DiVincenzo, who broke the New York Knicks record for three-pointers made in the season, is going to be huge for that team. Brings toughness, brings ability to shoot. Uh, got a lot of good young talent on the rise. Have an excellent coach in uh, Chris Finch. I expect Minnesota to be right there uh, toward the end of this uh, season in, in terms of competing to get out of the Western Conference and going to the finals. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're an exciting young team. We'll leave it there. Scott Perry, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Oh, thank you so much, Owen, for having Look forward to, to visiting with you more and talking more NBA basketball. Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson is out for the season after rupturing his Achilles on Sunday against the Bengals. That's a major blow to him and to the team that has in some ways invested more in him than any team has ever invested in a player. But the conversation following the injury has been as much about the Browns fans as anything else because some of them cheered when Watson was being carted off the field. Other Browns players like Miles Garrett spoke out against the fan reaction, and they're right, of course, it's never cool to cheer for an injury. And to be clear, the reason some Browns fans were glad to see Watson go down is not that he has been accused by 25 different women of sexual assault, it's that he's been bad this year. That's obviously speculation on my part, but this is the same fan base that mocked his accusers when Watson joined the team. If Browns players condemned that fan behavior at the time, I, I didn't see it. 
really the fans should be booing the front office that bet five years of this team's life, including Garrett's prime on Watson being worth the biggest guaranteed deal in NFL history, plus six draft picks, plus the karma kit of affiliating with this particular person. The whole thing has been a colossal failure. Don't cheer for an injury, but also don't trade for Deshaun Watson. To MLS, Joe Mansueto is the owner of the Chicago Fire, but he's better known for his work in the finance world as the founder of Morningstar, which is a massive financial services firm. Morningstar got where they are today by building a reputation for thoughtful, objective economic analysis. And Mansueto just did that for one of the biggest issues in sports in a way that is unheard of for sports team owners. Mansueto said that he will fund the Chicago Fire's new stadium and offered this as his rationale, quote, my personal view is that stadiums are not a great investment. They're big, costly to maintain, sit empty most of the time. And so to the extent that they create value, most of that accrues to the sports team, not the municipality. So to me, it's fair that the sports team should own it. Mansueto is saying what economists have been saying for years regarding the value of sports venues and where they go. Sports team owners, however, never say this because they want nine-figure handouts from local governments and they often get them. Mansueto, however, has a few reasons to paddle in the other direction. One is that he has the funds. His net worth is an estimated $7.2 billion. Another is that he may be more concerned about maintaining his reputation in the financial world than the club of sports owners. And third, that public money might not be there for him even if he wanted it. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker has been skeptical about giving money to the Bears and White Sox for a new stadium, and one imagines the answer would be the same for the fire. Don't expect Mansueto to start any kind of big trend here. One of the main reasons MLS is currently not interested in adopting promotion and relegation is that they want to ask local governments for big checks for their stadiums, and that's hard to do when your team might get dropped to the second division. Over to the NBA, Commissioner Adam Silver spoke with Sports Illustrated about his priorities now that he has a new media deal, a CBA in place, and the best stretch of parity the league has seen in decades. While the rest of us think expansion is the next big item, Silver downplayed that, saying he's worried about diluting talent and revenue, but played up WNBA expansion, basically implying that the league should grow deliberately, but can eventually be as large as the NBA. Even counting the teams that are scheduled to enter the league, that would involve doubling the W. Silver's biggest priority, according to him, is improving the watching experience and making it more personal. That could be key to expanding internationally, where there are language barriers, of course, to watching the U.S. broadcast, and there could be cultural differences as well that would make a well-tailored alt-cast a big hit in some markets. Tapping into fans in France, Eastern Europe, and especially China, where obviously there are some complications, those fans are the main way the NBA can really expand its reach right now, and Silver is very aware of that. The WNBA finished its season with record viewership and attendance numbers. The players followed up the big season by opting out of their CBA. Our reporter Margaret Fleming was at Game 5 of the Finals, and she joins us next. Joined now by a front office sports breaking news reporter Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Margaret. Hi, Owen. So you were at Game 5 of the WNBA Finals, Liberty versus Lynx. Uh, just first, what was the atmosphere like? It was insane. Just absolute madness in Brooklyn. Um, it was, I mean, it was wonderful. I've been to a lot of Liberty games, including last year's final game, um, where the, the Aces won. Um, and this was just like every Liberty game, you know, Brooklyn brought it. Like it was, it was really fun, but um, something about it, it was hard to describe you. Like you felt it in your chest. Like it was just so loud in there. Um, every, you know, every Liberty layup or every Lynx turnover was just everyone on their feet immediately. It was, it was crazy. Um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was really cool to see, um, you know, last year again, that trophy ceremony was the aces and, you know, it was cool to see a trophy ceremony, but also, um, just, you know, the atmosphere of kind of an empty building at that point versus this year, you know, it's, um, Teresa Weatherspoon crying and it's Jean-Claude Jones crying and it's everyone cheering so much that Niara Sabali can't even, you know, get her words out without the crowd cheering over her, you know, things like that. Like, it's just, it's so cool to kind of see that in person. So, um, yeah, it was just a really, really crazy cool atmosphere. Um, and yeah, I'm really, I'm really lucky I got to be there for it. Amazing that, you know, in this historic WNBA season, uh, the final series goes five games. The last game goes to overtime. It was kind of like, you know, the perfect way to cap it off. Whatever happened in this finals, like we had already 
you know, media had already accepted, fans had already accepted, the league had already accepted that this year was different. This year just, it was its breakthrough season, really, like, onto a different kind of national scale. Like, um, in kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, it was pulling a lot of these kind of, like, attendance and viewership numbers. But um, for a long time, it just wasn't really available on the right platforms for people to watch and care and know about it it wasn't you know it was it was the liberty being you know the games up in westchester for you know however a couple thousand fans versus barclays center for you know a record eighteen thousand. um so yeah all, all that to say it's like um the the league had already had a pretty big year um when it comes to the business of the league you know um money wise and attention wise um but then the finals just were all all that I could really ask for. I mean, the level of basketball was every single game was just like crazy. Like that the game three Sabrina shot, that long range shot was just insane. And then game four was crazy. I was I was sitting watching and I was like this the whole time, like with my hands up against my face. I was so nervous the whole time. Um just watching it and then of course game five was just so much back and forth such an uncharacteristic game specifically for the liberty but you know electric performances from unexpected characters kind of brought it together yeah and yeah to have it go to overtime like of course this series went to overtime of course this season it went to over it went to game five and it went to overtime and so next season it'll have best of seven next year um Maybe next year it'll be on ABC instead of Hocus Pocus, which was on ABC this year um, instead. You know, as as you'd expect in a game that was tied at the end of regulation that determines the champions, um, you know, we, we had like a, a controversy. There is a disputed mm-hmm. foul call, uh, which the Lynx coach said cost her team the championship. And maybe she's right in a game that's tied at the end of regulation. Pretty much every single thing that happened during the game may have, may have swung the championship. I mean, it reminds me of that, like, Super Bowl, the Eagles-Chiefs, like, down to the end, and just the controversy there, too. It's, yeah, it's adding, like, a level of legitimacy when people are um, caring enough to have an opinion that isn't just, oh, this is great, women's basketball, you know, <laughs> like, when it's like, really kind of getting into the game, and obviously that was, like, you know, an apl- a play that people can really have an opinion on, like, um, you know, people are you know, definitely should have opinions on a play like that. But um, yeah, like you were saying, it is it is cool to see um, people getting that into it for sure. Shortly after the season concluded, the WNBA players opted out of their of the CBA. Very expected, but also, you know, now now begins a pretty big negotiation between the players and the league. What are your expectations here? I feel like I've been writing about this and talking about this for a long time and still just seeing that announcement seeing watching the video that like the player association put out um the the theme of it is like we're opting out or like we're out um we're kind of the big letters and it's like whoa it kind of it was kind of like seeing it in front of me was kind of like um kind of sobering of like okay it's wow it's happening it's here um the reason that the w is doing this is because it was already kind of worked in and I think it was worked in because of this reason that they could opt out so that when the new media dollars come in, that can, you know, make its way to players. I don't think it's something that the W is trying to be that the, from the league side that they're trying to be stingy about in any way. I think the league negotiated this and wants to give it to its players. Uh, so I think both sides really have the best interests of everyone here. Um, I think the thing that's going to be really, really interesting is that, currently the way that it's split in the NFL or the NBA is that players get half of the revenue, you know, half of, half of the league's revenue ends up in player, player salaries. Um, and in the W that's like nine or 10% right now, it's not half. Um, and I think players are really aware of that. And so I think that's going to be the thing that's most interesting to me of like, yes, we're going to see 
you know, of that 9%, when you get more money in, that 9% is going to be bigger than it was before. Like, they're still, the salaries are still going to go up. But I think I'm going to be really interested to see if the players are able to make further progress in terms of getting more of that percentage. Um, because they've talked a lot about how they just want it to be equitable. They're not saying we need equal salaries to the men, but we want it to be equitable um, and how it isn't right now. And so I think I'm going to be, yeah, just the whole like ownership structure of the WNBA and um, how that sort of comes together. I think that's going to be the the kind of interesting part for me. But there, are, I mean, there are other parts about this. They have they have stuff in there. The the players' association saying, um, you know, we want to have facilities be more across the board. You know, we saw teams struggle this year with sharing facilities before a playoff game. You know, with um, you know, we saw it in Connecticut with like the Mohegan tribe, they had to share the facilities or, um, we see players all the time leaving teams like Chicago to go to a team like Phoenix where they can have their own practice facility. And so, um, I think, and Chicago is getting its own now, but I think, um, seeing them say we want across the league, a standard of what this is going to be. I think that's interesting. Um, they talked about retirement planning and retirement savings and something they want. So, I think those kind of outside of salary conversations will be interesting too. But um, yeah, going back to that percentage, that's going to be the most fascinating part to watch from my perspective. Yeah, very interesting. Margaret Fleming, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. The Brady rules put restrictions on Tom Brady as a broadcaster that go beyond inconvenient to making it very challenging for him to do his job. Our tuned-in columnist, Mike McCarthy, has the latest on that, plus insights into Cowboys owner Jerry Jones' aggressive approach to the media, and some reporting on the Unrivaled League. That's coming up next. It's time for Tuned In Tuesday with our tuned-in columnist, Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Glad to be here, Owen. Great to have you. So we got some some new info on the Brady rules, the rules that Tom Brady has to abide by as a broadcaster, given that he is now officially a part owner of the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, these include some things we already knew, like he can't attend workouts and practices. Uh, we also learned he cannot criticize teams or referees. This seems like it's going to be very hard for him to be a broadcaster. Yeah, that's my biggest problem, Owen. You know, the stuff about not being able to go to the facilities and not being able to go to practice. Well, you know, he's got a whole staff over at Fox Sports who can do that. Plus, he's Tom Brady. He's won Super Bowls. So, you know, I don't think there's something that, you know, the Indianapolis Colts are going to show him in practice that he hasn't seen before and that will just blow his mind. But, you know what I mean? He is a broadcaster who's supposed to work for us, the viewer, not be a mouthpiece for the NFL. And if you take away his ability to criticize referees and you take away his ability to criticize players, then he's not got have much left. I mean, one of the things to me that makes Troy Aikman the best at what he does is he doesn't, he's always willing to call bullshit on something like that. If he sees a dumb call or a dumb play, he will call the player out or the, the ref out. And Brady, I think has got to have that ability. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I think, you know, there he had that first game where people felt like he was a little stiff and the second game where, you know, I think he got much better reviews. And I think part of that was he was more willing to criticize Yes. and to, you know, to try to like, you know, I, I don't know if we know exactly the details here. I think, you know, obviously he's allowed to say that was a bad throw or maybe that was a bad play call, but I think he's not allowed to say the Jets should not have traded for Devontae Adams right. because they're going nowhere and they should just right. plan for the future. Um, the Browns are the worst run organization in the NFL. <laughs> yeah, right. right. And you know that stuff that that comes up, or, or yeah, on those bad calls, there are there are plenty of bad calls. Some of them are egregious enough that they're worth being called out by the broadcasters. It's going to be really awkward if he can't say that stuff. It, it is going to be really awkward. But I mean, to get back to the point you made a moment ago, I think the good news for Brady is he's really come a long way in six weeks. I mean, that first game, I was worried about him. I mean, he was stiff, and yeah. he sounded like a stiff. And he's really loosened up. His cadence is better. I love the self-deprecating humor uh, yesterday about Steve Spagnolo. Uh, you know, as a Giant fan who, you know, was there when Spags was leading the Giants' defensive teams to victories over Tom Brady, you know, particularly hit home for me. But that's the kind of stuff you want from Brady, right? You know, who does Tom Brady, the greatest uh, player in the NFL history, respect? 
you know, who does he fear the most on the other sideline? And it's Steve Spagnolo and those blitzes from 2007. So that's the kind of stuff that I think he's getting at, which is making his investment worth the money. The other thing, Owen, too, is, is this is not strictly a broadcast problem. A lot of people don't realize it or they don't talk about it. But Fox uh, hired Brady as a brand ambassador, right? Yeah. So he's there to be as much of a rainmaker as he is a broadcaster. So if Trump, uh, Fox is trying to sign some big deal with MasterCard or GM and Tom Brady comes into the, the boardroom as the closer and poses with your daughter, you're going to sign that deal, right? So uh, there's a couple of levels that going on here. Yeah, right. And presumably he keeps that value for the network and they'll, you know, I think they're willing to you know, deal with this stuff as it comes in. You just wonder if over time, there's just going to be moments where he's just going to get called out and it's going to be kind of embarrassing and awkward. I think 90% of fans won't care that much, but it's it's going to be, it, there will be moments, I'm sure, it where we say oh, like, the Brady rules are really, really constraining him. Yeah, the Brady rules are going to be embarrassing. And Tom is going to have to deal with it if he wants this ownership state. And Fox is going to have to deal with it. Yeah. Because, again, it gets down to honesty, right? Are you being right. honest with your audience? We're his ultimate bosses, right? We're the ones who are judging him on if he's telling us what he really sees and thinks, what he really believes, or if he's giving, you know, shining us on and giving us a song and dance and just collecting his paycheck. And there's a lot of guys uh, in the NFL and a lot of guys in other sports who've done that. I thought they could just go on TV and wing it and then, you know what I mean, not give us what, what they really think. And they don't want to join the hated media and criticize other coaches and players. Sorry, that's your job. Right, exactly. And as having this thought of, well, this is kind of like a, a one person set of rules, but because, you know, how many people could be a broadcaster and a team owner? And I was thinking, actually, the Manning brothers want to get in on ownership. You could see the Kelseys. You know, Jason Kelsey's already a broadcaster. You could see yeah. him maybe taking a slice of the Eagles. Maybe maybe Travis, too. Mahomes, I don't know if he wants to be a broadcaster. He could certainly be a team owner. Uh, so this might come up again. And it might dissuade, um, you know, someone like uh, a Manning or, yeah, maybe Jason Kelsey from from taking a slice of ownership. It's a great uh, path, I think, for ownership to, you know, have somebody, you know, who's so popular and so revered by fans as part of your group. I mean, it saves you if, you know, Dan Snyder had done this, maybe with a, you know, a Redskin legend like Joe Theismann or somebody, you know, maybe he wouldn't have been hated. Quite frankly, I'm shocked that Robert Kraft didn't think of it. I, I'm shocked that <laughs> Robert Kraft didn't figure out a way to give Brady a stake and keep him a part of the Patriots organization as long as he lives. Yeah. And actually, let's hop over to another uh, owner who's um, in the media. That, that would be Jerry Jones, um, who does a lot of interviews uh, and um, threatened a couple of radio hosts yes. in Boston. Or sorry, not Boston. A couple of radio hosts in, uh, in Dallas with their jobs uh, because they were asking him some tough questions. You spoke with Dale Hansen, who is another Dallas radio personality uh, who clashed with Jones in the past. Um, and and had you know dealt with some consequences for it. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn from Dale? Dale is a great guy. He's a Texas broadcasting legend. You know his voice is as big as the state. And he clashed with Jerry over his reporting and over his analysis of the team and his reporting on then coach Barry Switzer. And Jerry, behind the scenes, according to Dale, forced him out. Now that Jerry was a little bit more sneaky back then. You know what I mean? He worked behind the scenes and he kept his hands clean. This Jerry doesn't give a crap. He's telling these guys on their own show, I'm going to fire you and replace you with somebody else. So, you know, Jerry, despite his aw shucks attitude and his seeming media friendliness, and he's the friendliest NFL owner I've ever seen, you know, he does more interviews than 10 of them put together, will follow through on these threats if you push him. So I'm going to be very curious to see if, uh, you know, uh, Jerry orders the code red on these radio jocks or if he comes back to the show and says, ah, you know, we all just had a bad day. We're all on the same team, you know, and does his Jerry routine. Yeah, that, I, I'll be watching that same thing. Uh, before we let you go, uh, you had some, um, some other reporting on Unrivaled. So they're planning a full a full court press to bring in Caitlin Clark um, because she's she's Caitlin Clark. There's, she's one of one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is a new league. This is a startup league. They're going to go after her with everything they got. Uh, they've been trying to play it quiet, Owen. 
you know, they wanted her to, to relax, have an off season, do a little golfing. But I'm hearing that the next week or two, they're going to, you know, really ramp up a huge offer to Caitlin Clark to come in there and play in the league. And, you know, it's uh, a pretty good offer, I think, if you're uh, Caitlin Clark. I mean, you get to spend eight weeks in Miami in the dead of winter instead of uh, snow-covered Iowa. You know, you're hooping against the world's 30 best players. You get equity in new startup, which could take off given the, the – Emphasis on women's sports. So I, I think, uh, you know, she, she might be interested. Uh, and I think it's absolutely totally uh, on brand for them to go after her because nobody moves the TV needle like Caitlin Clark. Not a single athlete has done that the way she's done it ever since Tiger Woods. Yeah, that would be one more very interesting story to watch. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. Nike is all in on basketball. The league reached a 12-year extension to be the official outfitter of the NBA and WNBA, but the deal goes well beyond the swoosh on the jersey. It also involves the G League, and it includes a pledge from the NBA, WNBA, and Nike to grow youth basketball. That includes investments in coaching, training, player development, as well as increasing access to basketball worldwide, with a specific focus on improving the playing experience for girls. All of that is going to help Nike build relationships with the next generation of basketball talent and fans. That's it for today. Leave us a rating or review wherever you like to tune in or tell your friends about the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.